Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. Heidi is a classic novel written by Swiss author Johanna Spiri. It was originally published in 1881 in two parts, Heidi's Years of Learning and Travel, Heidi's Lair UND Wanderjar, and Heidi Makes Use of What She Has Learned, Heidi Can Brochen, was E.S. Jellern Hat. The story has since become one of the most well-loved and enduring children's books, captivating readers of all ages with its heartwarming narrative and picturesque portrayal of the Swiss Alps. The novel tells the story of Heidi, a young orphan girl who is sent to live with her reclusive grandfather in the Swiss Alps. Her grandfather, who is initially gruff and distant, gradually warms up to her and they form a deep bond. Heidi's innocence, kindness, and love for the mountains begin to transform the lives of those around her, including her grandfather and a young disabled girl named Clara whom she befriends in Frankfurt. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 1 Heidi's First Mountain Climb On a bright June morning, two figures, one a tall girl and the other a child, could be seen climbing a narrow mountain path that winds up from the pretty village of Mayenfeld to the lofty heights of the Old Mountain. In spite of the hot June sun, the child was clothed as if to keep off the bitterest frost. She did not look more than five years old, but what her natural figure was like would be hard to say, for she had on apparently two dresses, one above the other, and over these a thick red woolen shawl. Her small feet were shod in thick, nailed mountain shoes. When the wayfarers came to the hamlet known as Durfly, which is situated halfway up the mountain, they met with greetings from all sides, for the elder girl was now in her old home. As they were leaving the village, a voice called out, Wait a moment, Deet, if you are going on up the mountain, I will come along with you. The girl thus addressed stood still, and the child immediately let go her hand and seated herself on the ground. Are you tired, Heidi? asked her companion. No, I am hot, answered the child. We shall soon get to the top now. You must walk bravely on a little longer and take good, long steps, and in another hour we shall be there, said Deed. They were now joined by a stout, good-natured looking woman who walked on ahead with her old acquaintance. And where are you going with the child? asked the one who had just joined the party. I suppose it is the child your sister left? Yes, answered Deet. I am taking her up to uncle where she must stay. This child stay up there with all uncle. You must be out of your senses, Deet. How can you think of such a thing? The old man, however, will soon send you both packing off home again. He cannot very well do that, seeing that he is her grandfather. He must do something for her. I have had the charge of the child till now, and I can tell you, Barbel, I am not going to give up the chance which has just fallen to me of getting a good place for her sake. That would be all very well if you were like other people, said Barbel, but you know what he is. And what can he do with a child, especially with one so young? The child cannot possibly live with him. 
but where are you thinking of going yourself? To Frankfurt, where an extra good place awaits me, answered Deed. I am glad I am not the child, exclaimed Barbel. Not a creature knows anything about the old man up there. He will have nothing to do with anybody and never sets his foot inside a church from one year's end to another. When he does come down once in a while, everybody clears out of his way. The mere sight of him, with his bushy, gray eyebrows and immense beard, is alarming enough. All kinds of things are said about him. You, Deed, however, must certainly have learned a good deal concerning him from your sister. Yes, but I am not going to repeat what I heard. Suppose it should come to his ears. I should get into no end of trouble about it. Barbel put her arm through Deed's in a confidential sort of way and said, Now do just tell me what is wrong with the old man. Was he always shunned as he is now, and was he always so cross? I assure you I will hold my tongue if you will tell me. Very well then, I will tell you but just wait a moment, said Deed, looking around for Heidi who had slipped away unnoticed. I see where she is, exclaimed Barbel, look over there, and she pointed to a spot far away from the footpath. She is climbing up the slope yonder with Peter and his goats. But tell me about the old man. Did he ever have anything more than his two goats and his hut? I should think so indeed, replied Deet with animation. He was at one time the owner of one of the largest farms in Domlesk, where my mother used to live. But he drank and gambled away the whole of his property And when this became known to his mother and father, they died of sorrow, one shortly after the other. Uncle, having nothing left to him but his bad name, disappeared and it was heard that he had gone to Naples as a soldier. After twelve or fifteen years, he reappeared in Domleshk, bringing with him a young son whom he tried to place with some of his kinspeople. Every door, however, was shut in his face, for no one wished to have any more to do with him. Embittered by this treatment, he vowed never to set foot in Domleshk again, and he then came to Durfly where he lived with his little boy. His wife, it seemed, had died shortly after the child's birth. He must have accumulated some money during his absence, for he apprenticed his son Tobias to a carpenter. He was a steady lad and kindly received by everyone in Durfly. His father, however, was still looked upon with suspicion and it was even rumored that he had killed a man in some brawl at Naples. But why does everyone call him uncle? Surely he can't be uncle to everyone living in Durfly, asked Barbel. Our grandmothers were related so we used to call him uncle, and as my father had family connections with so many people in Durfly, soon everyone fell into the habit of calling him uncle, explained Deed. And what happened to Tobias? Further questioned Barbel, who was listening with deep interest. Tobias was taught his trade in Nels, and when he had served his apprenticeship, he came back to Durfly and married my sister Adelaide. But their happiness did not last long. Two years after their marriage, Tobias was killed in an accident. His wife was so overcome with grief that she fell into a fever from which she never recovered. She had always been rather delicate and subject to curious attacks during which no one knew whether she was awake or sleeping. And so two months after Tobias had been carried to the grave, his wife followed him. Their sad fate was the talk of everybody far and near, and the general opinion was expressed that it was a punishment which uncle deserved for the godless life he had led. Our minister endeavored to awaken his conscience, 
but the old man grew only more wrathful and stubborn and would not speak to a soul. All at once we heard that he had gone to live up on the Alm mountain and that he did not intend to come down again. Since then, he has led his solitary life up there and everyone knows him now by the name of Alm Uncle. Mother and I took Adelaide's little one, then only a year old, into our care. When mother died last year and I went down to the baths to earn some money, I paid old Ursel to take care of her. So you see I have done my duty, now it's uncle's turn. But where are you going to yourself, Barbel? We are now halfway up the Alm. We have just reached the place I wanted, answered Barbel. I must see Peter's mother who is doing some spinning for me. So goodbye, Deet and good luck to you. She went toward a small, dark brown hut which stood a few steps away from the path in a hollow that afforded it some protection from the mountain wind. Here lived Peter, the eleven-year-old boy, with his mother Brigida and his blind grandmother who was known to all the old and young in the neighborhood as just grandmother. Every morning Peter went down to Durafly to bring up a flock of goats to browse on the mountain. At sundown he went skipping down the mountain again with his light-footed animals. When he reached Durafly he would give a shrill whistle whereupon all the owners of the goats would come out to take home the animals that belonged to them. Deet had been standing for a good ten minutes looking about her in every direction for some sign of the children and the goats. Meanwhile Heidi and the goat herd were climbing up by a far and roundabout way for Peter knew many spots where all kinds of good food in the shape of shrubs and plants grew for his goats. The child, exhausted with the heat and weight of her thick clothes, panted and struggled after him at first with some difficulty. She said nothing but her little eyes kept watching first Peter as he sprang nimbly hither and thither on his bare feet clad only in his short, light breeches and then the slim-legged goats that went leaping over rocks and shrubs. All at once she sat down on the ground and began pulling off her shoes and stockings. Then she unwound the hot red shawl and took off her frock. But there was still another to unfasten, for Dee had put the Sunday dress on over the everyday one to save the trouble of carrying it. Quick as lightning, the everyday frock followed the other, and now the child stood up, clad only in her light short-sleeved undergarment. She stretched out her little bare arms with glee. Leaving all her clothes together in a tidy little heap, she went jumping and climbing up after Peter and the goats as nimbly as any of the party. Now that Heidi was able to move at her ease, she began to enter into conversation with Peter. She asked him how many goats he had, where he was going to with them, and what he had to do when he arrived there. At last, after some time, they came within view of Deet. Hardly had the latter caught sight of the little company climbing up towards her when she shrieked out, Heidi, what have you been doing? What a sight you have made of yourself. And where are your two frocks and the red wrapper? And the new shoes I bought and the new stockings I knitted for you everything gone. Not a thing left. What can you have been thinking of, Heidi? Where are all your clothes? The child quietly pointed to a spot below on the mountainside and answered, Down there. You good for nothing little thing, exclaimed Deet angrily. What could have put it into your head to do that? What made you undress yourself? What do you mean by it? I don't want any clothes, said Heidi. You wretched, thoughtless child. Have you no sense in you at all? Continued Deed, scolding and lamenting. Peter, 
You go down and fetch them for me as quickly as you can, and you shall have something nice. And she held out a bright new piece of money to him that sparkled in the sun. Peter was immediately off down the steep mountainside, taking the shortest cut, and was back again so quickly with the clothes that even Deet was obliged to give him a word of praise as she handed him the promised money. Peter promptly thrust it into his pocket and his face beamed with delight, for it was not often that he was the happy possessor of such riches. You can carry the things up for me as far as uncles, as you are going the same way, went on Deet, who was preparing to continue her climb up the mountainside, which rose in a steep ascent immediately behind the goat herd's hut. Peter willingly undertook to do this and followed after her. After a climb of more than three quarters of an hour, they reached the top of the Alm Mountain. Uncle's hut stood on a projection of the rock, exposed indeed to the winds, but where every ray of sun could rest upon it and a full view could be had of the valley beneath. Behind the hut stood three old fir trees with long, thick, unlocked branches. Beyond these rose a further wall of mountain the lower heights still overgrown with beautiful grass and plants. Against the hut, on the side looking towards the valley, uncle had put up a seat. Here he was sitting, his pipe in his mouth and his hands on his knees, quietly looking out when the children, the goats, and Deet suddenly clambered into view. Heidi was at the top first. She went straight up to the old man, put out her hand, and said, Good evening, Grandfather. So, so, what is the meaning of this? He asked gruffly, as he gave the child an abrupt shake of the hand and gazed at her from under his bushy eyebrows. Heidi stared steadily back at him in return with unflinching gaze. Meanwhile, Deed had come up with Peter after her. I wish you good day, uncle, said Deed, as she walked towards him, and I have brought you Tobias and Adelaide's child. You will hardly recognize her, as you have never seen her since she was a year old. And what has the child to do with me up here, asked the old man curtly. You there, he then called out to Peter, be off with your goats, you are none too early as it is, and take mine with you. Peter obeyed on the instant and quickly disappeared. The child is here to remain with you, Deet made answer. I have done my duty by her for these four years, and now it is time for you to do yours. That's it, is it, said the old man as he looked at her with a flash in his eye. And when the child begins to fret and whine after you, what am I to do with her then? That's your affair, retorted Deet. If you cannot arrange to keep her, do with her as you like. You will be answerable for the result if harm happens to her, though you have hardly need to add to the burden already on your conscience. Now Deet was not quite easy in her own conscience about what she was doing and consequently was feeling hot and irritable and said more than she had intended. As she uttered her last words, Uncle rose from his seat. He looked at her in a way that made her draw back a step or two, then flinging out his arm, he said to her in a commanding voice, be off with you this instant and get back as quickly as you can to the place whence you came and do not let me see your face again in a hurry. Dee did not wait to be told twice. Goodbye to you then and to you too. Heidi, she called, as she turned quickly away and started to descend the mountain at a running pace, which she did not slacken till she found herself safely again at Durfly. Chapter 2 A New Home with Grandfather As soon as Deet had disappeared the old man went back to his bench and there he remained seated, staring at the ground without uttering a sound while thick curls of smoke floated upward from his pipe. Heidi, meanwhile, 
was enjoying herself in her new surroundings, she looked about till she found a shed built against the hut where the goats were kept. She peeped in and saw it was empty. She continued her search but presently came back to where her grandfather was sitting. Seeing that he was in exactly the same position as when she left him, she went and placed herself in front of the old man and said, I want to see what you have inside the house. Come then, and the grandfather rose and went before her towards the hut. Bring your bundle of clothes in with you, he bid her as she was following. I shan't want them anymore, was her prompt answer. The old man turned and looked searchingly at the child, whose dark eyes were sparkling in delighted anticipation of what she was going to see inside. She is certainly not wanting in intelligence, he murmured to himself. And why shall you not want them any more? he asked aloud. Because I want to go about like the goats with their thin light legs. Well, you can do so if you like, said her grandfather, but bring the things in, we must put them in the cupboard. Heidi did as she was told. The old man now opened the door and Heidi stepped inside after him. She found herself in a good sized room which covered the whole ground floor of the hut. A table and a chair were the only furniture. In one corner stood the grandfather's bed, in another was the hearth with a large kettle hanging above it, and on the further side was a large door in the wall. This was the cupboard. The grandfather opened it. Inside were his clothes. On a second shelf were some plates and cups and glasses, and on a higher one still, a round loaf, smoked meat, and cheese, for everything that all Uncle needed for his food and clothing was kept in this cupboard. Heidi thrust in her bundle of clothes as far back behind her grandfather's things as possible so that they might not easily be found again. She then looked carefully round the room and asked, Where am I to sleep, grandfather? Wherever you like, he answered. Heidi was delighted and began at once to examine all the nooks and corners to find out where it would be pleasantest to sleep. In the corner near her grandfather's bed, she saw a short ladder against the wall. Up she climbed and found herself in the hayloft. There lay a large heap of fresh, sweet-smelling hay, while through a round window in the wall, she could see right down the valley. I shall sleep up here, grandfather, she called down to him, it's lovely, up here. Come up and see how lovely it is. Oh, I know all about it, he called up in answer. I am getting the bed ready now, she called down again as she went busily to and fro at her work, but I shall want you to bring me up a sheet. You can't have a bed without a sheet you want it to lie upon. All right, said the grandfather and presently he went to the cupboard and after rummaging about inside for a few minutes he drew out a long, coarse piece of stuff which was all he had to do duty for a sheet. He carried it up to the loft where he found Heidi had already made quite a nice bed. She had put an extra heap of hay at one end for a pillow and had so arranged it that when in bed she would be able to see comfortably out through the round window. That is capital, said her grandfather, now we must put on the sheet. They spread it over the bed, and where it was too long or too broad, Heidi quickly tucked it in under the hay. It looked as tidy and comfortable a bed as you could wish for, and Heidi stood gazing thoughtfully at her handiwork. We have forgotten something now, grandfather, she said after a short silence. What's that? he asked. A coverlid. When you get into bed, you have to creep in between the sheet and the coverlid. Oh, that's the way, is it? But suppose I have not got a coverlid, said the old man. Well, never mind, grandfather, 
said Heidi in a consoling tone of voice. I can take some more hay to put over me. And she was turning quickly to fetch another armful from the heap when her grandfather stopped her. Wait a moment, he said, and he climbed down the ladder again and went towards his bed. He returned to the loft with a large, thick sack made of flax which he laid tidily over the bed. That is a splendid coverlid, said Heidi, and the bed looks lovely altogether. I wish it was night so that I might get inside it at once. I think we had better go down and have something to eat first, said the grandfather. While the kettle was boiling, the old man held a large piece of cheese on a long iron fork over the fire, turning it round and round till it was toasted a nice golden yellow color on each side. Heidi watched all that was going on with eager curiosity. Suddenly some new idea seemed to come into her head, for she turned and ran to the cupboard and then began going busily backwards and forwards. Presently the grandfather got up and came to the table with the jug and the cheese, and there he saw it already tidily laid with the round loaf and two plates and two knives each in its right place. Ah, that's right, said the grandfather, I am glad to see that you have some ideas of your own, and as he spoke he laid the toasted cheese on a layer of bread, but there is still something missing. Heidi looked at the jug that was steaming away invitingly and ran quickly back to the cupboard. At first she could only see a small bowl left on the shelf, but she was not long in perplexity, for a moment later she caught sight of two glasses further back and without an instant's loss of time she returned with these and the bowl and put them down on the table. Good, I see you know how to set about things. But what will you do for a seat? The grandfather himself was sitting on the only chair in the room. Heidi flew to the hearth and dragging the three-legged stool up to the table, sat herself down upon it. The grandfather filled the bowl with milk and pushed it in front of Heidi. Then he brought her a large slice of bread and a piece of the golden cheese and told her to eat. Heidi lifted the bowl with both hands and drank without pause till it was empty for the thirst of all her long, hot journey had returned upon her. Then she drew a deep breath in the eagerness of her thirst. She had not stopped to breathe and put down the bowl. Was the milk nice? he asked. I never drank any so good before, answered Heidi. Then you must have some more and the old man filled her bowl again to the brim and set it before the child, who was now hungrily beginning her bread, having first spread it with the cheese, which after being toasted was soft as butter. The meal being over, the grandfather went outside to put the goat shed in order, and Heidi watched with interest while he first swept it out, and then put fresh straw for the goats to sleep upon. Then he went to the little well shed, and there he cut some long, round sticks and a small, round board. In this he bored some holes and stuck the sticks into them, and there, as if made by magic, was a three-legged stool just like her grandfather's, only higher. Heidi stood and looked at it, speechless with astonishment. What do you think that is? asked her grandfather. It's my stool, I know because it is such a high one, and it was made all of a minute," said the child, still lost in wonder and admiration. She understands what she sees, her eyes are in the right place, remarked the grandfather to himself. And so the time passed happily on till evening. Then the wind began to roar louder than ever through the old fir trees, Heidi listened with delight to the sound and it filled her heart so full of gladness that she skipped and danced round the old trees as if some unheard of joy had come to her. The grandfather stood and watched her from the shed. Suddenly a shrill whistle was heard. Down from the heights above, the goats came springing one after another 
with Peter in their midst. Heidi sprang forward with a cry of joy and rushed among the flock, greeting first one and then another of her old friends of the morning. As they neared the hut, the goats stood still, and then two of their number, two beautiful, slender animals, one white and one brown, ran forward to where the grandfather was standing and began licking his hands, for he was holding a little salt which he always had ready for his goats on their return home. Peter went on down the mountain with the remainder of his flock. Heidi tenderly stroked the two goats in turn, jumping about in her glee at the pretty little animals. Are they ours, grandfather? Are they both ours? Are you going to put them in the shed? Will they always stay with us? Heidi's questions came tumbling out one after the other so that her grandfather had only time to answer each of them with yes, yes. When the goats had finished licking up the salt, her grandfather told her to go and fetch her bowl and the bread. Heidi obeyed and was soon back again. The grandfather milked the white goat and filled her basin and then breaking off a piece of bread, now eat your supper, he said, and then go up to bed. Deet left another little bundle for you with a nightgown and other small things in it, which you will find at the bottom of the cupboard if you want them. I must go and shut up the goats, so be off and sleep well. Good night, Grandfather. Good night. What are their names, Grandfather? What are their names? She called out as she ran after his retreating figure and the goats. The white one is named Little Swan, and the brown one Little Bear, he answered. Good night, Little Swan, good night, Little Bear, she called again at the top of her voice. Then she ate her supper and went indoors and climbed up to her bed, where she was soon lying as sweetly and soundly asleep as any young princess on her couch of silk.